Thank you for joining us for this evening's event. My name is Bree Hogan. I'm the sales manager of Powell's Books here in Portland, Oregon. Before we begin, I want to remind you that you can keep up with all of our virtual events by visiting our website at powells.com. One of the many upcoming events we're looking forward to is Lawrence Roberts in conversation with Barry Johnson about Roberts' new book, May Day 1971, A White House at War, A Revolt in the Streets, and the Untold History of America's Biggest Mass Arrest. That event is this Thursday, the 24th. You can find information about it and all of our other Powell's happenings and events at Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram, as well as at powells.com. Tonight, we're very excited to welcome Zephyr Teachout and E.J. Dion Jr. Zephyr is an attorney, political activist, and antitrust and corruption expert. A rising star on the left, her campaign for the New York Attorney General in 2018 was endorsed by Bernie Sanders, the New York Times, and others. She was part of the team of lawyers that sued Donald Trump for allegedly violating the emulence clause of the Constitution. Teachout sits on the board of the directors of the Open Markets Institute and teaches law at Fordham University. In her new book, Break Em Up, Recovering Our Freedom from Big Egg, Big Tech, and Big Money, Teachout offers a call for liberals and leftists looking to find a common cause. Teachout makes a compelling case that monopolies are the root cause of many of the issues that today's progressives care about. They drive economic inequality, harm the planet, limit the political power of the average citizens, and historically disenfranchised groups bear the brunt of their shameful and irresponsible business practices. Teachout argues that in order to build a better future, we must eradicate monopolies from the private sector and create new safeguards that prevent new ones from seizing power. Joining Teach Out tonight in conversation is E.J. Dion Jr. E.J. is a columnist for the Washington Post, senior fellow at the Brookings Institution, professor at Georgetown University, and visiting professor at Harvard University. He is co-author of the recent New York Times bestseller, One Nation After Trump, and author of Why the Right Went Wrong. In his new book, Code Red, How Progressives and Moderates Can Unite to Save Our Country, Dion provides a blueprint for change that stresses the need for a coalition as diverse in its political orientation as it will be across the lines of race, re region, and ethnicity, from democratic socialists to those who once have been called liberal Republicans. Code Red calls for shared commitment to decency and politics focused on freedom, fairness, and the future, encouraging progressives and moderates to sustain the unity that brought the Democrat Democrats victories in the 2018 elections and he offers a unifying model centered on solving problems, restoring dignity to those left behind and tackling issues like gun violence, low wages and health care. It's a pleasure to have both EJ and Zephyr here to join us in this conversation. Uh, they will be taking questions later on in our program. So you can use that Q&A button at the bottom of your screen there to submit those questions. We do ask that you submit questions in the Q&A field rather than in the chat. Um, we're so happy to have you both here to talk about these very meaty and weighty uh, conversations and topics. Thank you for joining us. Thank you so much for having us. What a joy to be here. It's one of the great bookstores in our country. Uh, and in fact, Zephyr has a great line in her book, which we'll get to, about the difference between profit seeking and profit maximization. And bookstores are good old fashioned moral capitalist profit seeking rather than profit maximization. Uh, institutions. I, I just want to say it's a great joy to be with you, Zephyr. We were talking before. Uh, we went on that my I first heard of Zephyr Teachout during in 2003, the end of 2003. Some of you may remember out there, Howard Dean was raising all this money online, and it was this brand new thing. And I was asking around, and I said, "Who is doing this?" And they told me this brilliant 20-something woman named Zephyr Teachout. And I wanted to know who she was and where she got her really interesting name uh, and how she had pulled this off. So it's a real joy uh, to be with you uh, uh, to talk about this great book of yours. Well, it's such a pleasure to be with you. And I was also remembering that. And thank you for covering the 
experiments in democracy we were engaged in at the time, and we'll get into it, but I, but I think that there's a really deep shared theme here that has to do with freedom and dignity and sort of recovering uh, politics around um, that really uh, center themselves in these core values um, and that only when we move back and remember these values uh, can we actually move forward. Um, and, and, and anyway, I'm really grateful for you uh, to doing this conversation, for doing this conversation with me. <laughs> Oh, thank you. And, and in fact, economic dignity is a core argument of the book, of my book, yes. Code Red. And I felt economic dignity running through these pages uh, of your book. And I wanted to start with something that I think is on the minds of a lot of people who might be watching this, which is the death of Ruth Bader Ginsburg and the fact that we are facing an enormous court fight that we actually shouldn't be having until next year, uh, in my view, I think in your yes. uh, view, the notion of cramming a sixth conservative justice on the court is very disturbing to us both. But I think one of the, I wanna start there with your book because um, people talk a lot about Roe and certain other issues. I think they, we don't talk enough about the ways in which court decisions uh, have in recent years really undercut our democracy itself. Uh, we can talk later about the Citizens United decision in which you are cited both by uh, the late uh, John Paul Stevens in his dissent and then Justice Scalia goes after you, which is I think a high honor and compliment to you. But in the book, um, you talk about how anti-monopoly, antitrust was fundamentally changed in the 19, our, our notion of what it meant was fundamentally changed in the 1980s. And we can go back historically a bit, but you talk about how a, a group of conservative judges, particularly Antonin Scalia, Frank Easterbrook, and Richard Posner reinterpreted the meaning of antitrust. Uh, let me just quote you at yourself. Um, they reinterpreted antitrust laws as price protection tools. They rejected a vision uh, that these laws were designed to curb despotism. So what I'd like you to do here is talk a bit about the fight over the court, because I think people are thinking about it, and talk about how the reinterpretation of antitrust laws really changed a long trajectory that goes back to the 1880s in our country, and certainly to the progressive period. Absolutely. So a, a brief bit about before Reagan, and then talking about what Reagan brought in. Um, and the true judicial revolution in economic power, uh, uh, which is, uh, we, we are living in that legacy now, is that before 1980, um, there was a really broad understanding that economic power, uh, overly concentrated economic power was a risk to democracy. Um, and that there was a value in having decentralized power. There was a value in strictly enforcing antitrust laws even in a prophylactic way. So there's a couple of companies that are gonna merge. You say, well, there's a risk that that merger could lead to them having so much power that they effectively control uh, an entire industry um, and then have that power seep into our uh, political sphere. Uh, Justice Douglas said, all forms of a private power tend to form into a government in and of themselves. There's this just broad understanding that anti-monopoly and antitrust is a democratic tool and a key democratic tool. And when Reagan came in, um, he had a few key agendas. Uh, one was a, a not so subtle uh, uh, agenda to restore was the language he would use, but um, uh, very much an anti-civil rights agenda. Um, and um, uh, along with that sort of uh, anti-civil rights agenda, he brought and with his California wrecking crew, Meese and Baxter and others, um, a, a, an, a, a deregulatory agenda. But at the heart of that deregulatory agenda was changing antitrust. And they talked about it at the time. You see profiles of, um, of his close associates like Baxter, and they say their two agendas are overturning uh, civil rights and changing antitrust law. And you think, what? Why? Why antitrust? 
Um, but they, they, they made that a core part of their agenda and Reagan did a few things very quickly. Uh, one is he appointed enforcers who didn't want to enforce, which is something that we are very familiar with um, right now with, a, um, with uh, the Trump administration. Um, and the number of cases just radically dropped. And the enforcers started into saying, well, there isn't an antitrust case unless there's a real problem with the threat of prices going up. But then he also just filled the courts. And among others, appoint, appointed um, Justice Scalia, uh, but it wasn't just Scalia, it was uh, uh, judges throughout the country who, who basically rewrote antitrust laws through judicial decisions. And you don't need to be an expert in this area to understand a few basic things. One is that antitrust law is quasi-constitutional. Like the key antitrust law, the Sherman Act, is about as long as the First Amendment. It's really short. It basically says, you may not monopolize. So like the, uh, the short uh, portions of our Constitution, justices and judges have an enormous impact because how they interpret what monopolize means shifted radically from the 70s to, uh, to the 80s, the 90s, and today and moved from understanding uh, monopoly as a, 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 a threat when there's too much market power to today where we only think about it in terms of, well, if the prices are gonna rise. So they, it, the, the real impact, the just human impact was, we've been in a 40 year merger wave and you see it in every industry. We're talking today about one of, I mean, our, such a consequential decision. And I think it was wholly illegitimate to appoint or to try to appoint, and I'm hoping we can stop it. It's hard, um, a justice at this moment. But uh, while we talk about these other issues, uh, remember that a justice's economic theory, uh, his or her understanding about the relationship between citizens, power, and workers, that can have an enormous impact on inequality, um, on power, and on our democracy. And uh, uh, the, the antitrust ideology of the right right now is basically, why even have this? In fact, one more thing, EJ, and then I want to turn it back to you, is um, uh, Scalia actually during his appointment, um, during his confirmation hearings, was asked about um, uh, antitrust. And what he said is, I never understood it in law school, and later I... I uh, I realized that I didn't need to because it doesn't make any sense anyway. It was a joke. But it shows how trivially they take this serious, what I see as a sort of a core protection of citizens having power and not being governed by um, private corporations. And I think your discussion of antitrust is so important to this coming argument because the standard conservative uh, thing that they say all the time is liberals rewrite law from the bench. And in fact, in your book, what you show is some of the most radical rewrites of law have been done by conservatives. And I also think it's so important to see these fights in terms of democracy. When you look at Citizens United, a decision that undercut laws against uh, the money power, the power of money in politics, and then Shelby County's decision, which undercut the Voting Rights Act, it was empowering very wealthy people and disempowering African Americans and poor people. And it's an astonishing use of power. And that was done by conservatives using, uh, overturning uh, years of precedent. Um, you're, 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 a, you're absolutely right. And both of those cases were um, uh, su such divergences from precedent. In Shelby right. County, um, it was a shocking uh, amount of creativity, and that's a, a generous word on um, <laughs> uh, on Justice's Justice Roberts' part. And actually, the the preceding case to Citizens United, when I started writing about corruption, because you could see the writing on the wall, is when Justice Roberts, and this really is Roberts' court, um, and it is a very corporate court. Um, uh, Roberts uh, acted impatient with the idea that corruption could be anything but an explicit quid pro quo. He said in a 2007 opinion, enough is enough. Why are we even talking about corruption? And 
when he did that, as, as Scalia has done in some really consequential decisions in antitrust law, uh, he was engaged in terrible history, disrespectful history, a bad law, bad history, bad precedent, and it is not conservative in any sense. It's a real, it's a real uh, imposition of, of a, a form of corporate governance. And what comes through in these cases, and I'm glad you show the connection, is that they're really dismissive of democracy and think, oh, well, the, the private sector will work it all out. Um, uh, and uh, the, as we see, um, there's uh, uh, the, the enormous costs of, of corporate concentration and corporate ruthlessness in the private sector are not working it out. Um, I, we believe in democracy. This is a core <laughs> value. And a lot of these justices really think it's just a dirty, a dirty game. And uh, I think that's one of the things that comes through in Citizens United. Um, and you mentioned the two decisions that haunt me, the Shelby County and Citizens United. Is... <laughs> Same here. I, I want to ask you about the most interesting word in your book and what I took to be the most interesting and liberating sentence in your book. The most interesting word in the book, I won't, this won't surprise you, is chickenization. Uh, not an idea, and you're not talking about KFC or Chick-fil-A, uh, although in a way, uh, but yeah, if you could talk about chickenization, but what I took to be uh, the most liberating sentence in the book, we can build any kind of corporate law and market structure we want. I, I just think it was such an important idea because we hear people talk about the market. The market says this, the market demands that, as if there's only one kind of market, one set of rules for the market, when in fact, we can structure markets in a great many ways and structure power within the market in a great many ways. I love you. That's, in a sense, what your book is all about. So tell us a bit, and, and these two thoughts, I think, link chickenization and that sentence I wrote. If you could talk about that a bit. It's the single most important sentence in the book, this idea that we can do what we want. So thank you. And, and interestingly, it's something where you see uh, left, right, moderates some, uh, uh, coalesce in a, in a sense of inevitabilism. Like right. we, need, we need to, you know, I'm, I'm uh, in favor of pretty significant taxes. I'm a progressive Democrat, a very open progressive Democrat. Um, but taxation alone suggests like we've got the market we want, now let's tax the problematic elements of it, as opposed to, you know, we can organize markets in all kinds of different ways. There's nothing inevitable about the current system and we've lived in lots of different kinds of market structures. One way to think about it is in your head, do you have a, a natural metaphor or a mechanical metaphor for the market? And I think a lot of people have a somewhat natural metaphor. They think of it as a, a thing that inevitably exists and that you try to trim it, <laughs> um, as opposed to thinking about it like a car, like, okay, we want it to do these kinds of things, it'll do these kinds of things. We want the machine to do something else, it can do something else. Um, and I think that's really important and it's something that um, we all kind of understand, like we don't go to a, you know, a farmer's market and think, oh, there are no rules here. The question is, what are the rules, um, and what what kinds of values do those rules uh, represent? Um, so, chickenization. Um, one of the ways I wanted to what, so one area where I think people get the most sort of eyes glaze over and feel the most impotent is when it comes to big tech um, or the gig economy. Um, and what we I think all see happening is more and more work getting contracted out, the, the gig economy taking over more and more areas of our work. But there's a set ten tendency to think of that as inevitable and uh, just a, a fact that we have to uh, ameliorate. And, and the reason I start with and talk a lot about chickenization and chicken farming in particular is I want to demystify the market and say, okay, let's look at two different kinds of market structures that we've had in our country in terms of how chickens are sold, how chickens are raised and how chickens are sold. And people don't feel, even if you don't know any farmers, and I do know some, I'm from a rural area, uh, people don't feel intimidated by talking about market structure when it comes to farming. Um, so what we've seen happen in the chicken industry 
is um, because of Reagan's judges coming in and reinterpreting uh, antitrust laws, this radical mer merger wave where uh, companies that are key distributors, think Tyson, Purdue, Pilgrims, um, buy up all their competitors until there's only three or four left, start to control a region, and then buy up ancillary services like the feed, the eggs. Not We're no longer just distributors. We also own uh, the consultants who tell you how you have to treat your chickens. Um, and so chicken farmers, theoretically, they look free from a distance. They, uh, they look like small businessmen and women. But when you actually talk to them, they say, if I'm going to get my chicken to market, I have to do whatever Tyson says, whatever they say. I have to use their feet. I have to use their eggs. I have to use their, their counselors. But it doesn't stop there. It's that they also have to um, agree not to talk to their neighbors, not to find out how much their neighbors are paid, other chicken farmers, agree to get paid different amounts every month, and not know why they're getting paid different amounts every month. And so they're stuck in a state of, of really of incredible anger. I mean, a lot of chicken farmers I talked to, I ended up writing about depression and suicide more than I expected, but um, it's really important to think about the human impacts of these economic structures, chicken farmers feel paranoid and an overwhelming debilitating anger at their distributors because they don't know when they have a bad month, whether it's something they did or because they uh, irritated or spoke out politically against Tyson or because the weather was bad or because Tyson is experimenting and giving 50 chicken farmers one kind of uh, a seed and another set and they're subjects in an experiment that they don't know about. And um, that experience, that relationship of Tyson to a chicken farmer, I argue, it's a term I didn't make up. It's a, a great journalist, uh, Chris Leonard wrote about it, um, that the, actually the other meat industries have said, oh, we should chickenize. So beef and pork have started doing the same thing. But that's what's happening with Uber drivers. It's the same relationship of the driver to the platform. That's what's happening with Amazon sellers who are similarly totally dependent on this platform, Amazon, and uh, Amazon can make or break them. They, uh, but they need to be on Amazon to sell um, and they don't know why or when they're being highly ranked or poorly ranked. So it's, and the thing that we're really seeing right now is it's um, restaurants relationship to delivery apps, especially during a pandemic. If you're a restaurant, if you're not on a, a delivery app, it's like a chicken farmer not being able to deliver through Tyson. It's your the restaurant can't survive because it's such a significant percentage. And that means that Seamless can then use its uh, contractual power to say, hey, restaurant, give me all your data and I'm going to treat you in different ways and you're not going to know how you're treated. Um, uh, and and I, I wanted to really humanize what monopolization does because this is only possible when you only have a few players in the game. If a chicken farmer says, hey, I don't like Tyson, I'm gonna go to one of my other five distributors, Tyson can't do that anymore. If there's real competitors in the um, uh, uh, car for hire market, Uber drivers can negotiate and go elsewhere. And so it's really important to just go back to the basics of power. I'm not telling you anything that people in 1960 didn't understand about <laughs> anti-monopoly. It's just that we forgot it. Um, that uh, that, we, that we, should, we should think about decentralizing power because only if we decentralize power can workers then workers and, and small business owners regain their relative power. Let me, there, were, there were already several good questions uh, that I want to get okay. to, um, but I want to I step back, his, uh, take a look historically. I remember years ago, uh, I was talking with two other friends, and all three of us thought of ourselves as progressive in one way or another. Um, but one of them was very pro-market anti-monopoly. And we were talking about the 1912 election, one of the great yes. elections in our country's history, where William Howard Taft was a conservative. Woodrow Wilson, although racist and, and terrible in many ways, was a progressive in other ways. But he was a break up the monopolies guy in response to concentration. Eugene B. Debs, who got 6% of the vote, was a democratic socialist. And Teddy Roosevelt was the new nationalist, not a Trumpian nationalist. But he really thought breaking up the monopolies uh, 
might not be, even though he's known as a trust buster, felt that regulating them in the public interest was actually better. And it was funny, we joked that our differences were displayed there because one friend would have voted for Debs, um, the other friend would have voted for, Rose, for uh, Wilson, and as I explained at the time, I would have flirted with Debs and voted for TR. Okay. Um, <laughs> um, the reason is I've always wondered um, whether regulation is often more helpful than anti-monopoly. Now, you explicitly argue in the book uh, that anti-monopoly and strong regulation are not opposed to each other. They actually go hand in hand. But I'd love you to revisit Brandeis a little bit, and then I promise to, we got three good questions in the chat that we will get to uh, after that. But I think understanding this difference, because I think among progressives, well-meaning progressives, there's a yeah. legitimate argument about what's the best way to handle these problems. Well, first of all, it, it warms my heart to know you were having the 1912 debate. <laughs> because because uh, if I do nothing else, <laughs> the goal is to uh, light the fire under this very urgent debate, is that we have a crisis of concentrated power. And I don't think, uh, I, I, maybe there are a handful of people who will deny it, but there, uh, I, I, the, when you poll on it, and I recently did a poll with Data for Progress, politicians aren't talking about it, but the public cares about it. <laughs> People really don't like concentrated power. A majority of, by the way, this is not a partisan issue. It's really interesting. It doesn't line up neatly on partisan lines. No. <laughs> um, uh, Republicans and Democrats at about the same level, um, in between 50 and 60% want a president who's gonna do more, want uh, to break up cable, want to take on big tech and big ag. Um, a handful, less than 20% don't think so. And then another 24% said, I don't know, because, but I'm saying that even while politicians aren't talking about it, people get it. The, um, the, um, there's incredible anger around corporate power. So we have to do something about it, which means then the debate should not be, is there a problem, but what do we do about it? Um, and uh, within the anti-monopoly tradition, there is a, uh, a sort of a socialist strain of the late 19th century. Um, and Du Bois is sort of a, a big anti-monopolist um, and a representative of, of the more socialist strain. Um, and then uh, Brandeis is representative of, uh, and probably one of the most um, well-known and uh, articulate uh, early 20th century anti-monopolists who really also, going back to your book on dignity and our shared interest in dignity, really focused on the way economic and political structures interacted and, and how economic structures were important for a democracy. And I'm probably a Brandeisian with a little socialist <laughs> sprinkled in. Um, and I, and I, do, I do think that too often the, the debate, and I'm, I'm really shaking the shoulders of progressives in this book, because I think progressives have not made anti-monopoly a central part of their demands. Uh, um, to quote the book, the left has failed to understand the magnitude of the concentration problem. Yeah, you may, That's, yeah. you may think you don't like big corporate power, but when's the last time that you've been uh, talking to your candidates and saying, what's your antitrust position? What, what are your new laws? What, uh, uh, when is the last time that you occupied the FTC or protested because of, of a merger? But to answer your question, I think that um, uh, I, I'm, I'm open to the uh, arenas in which you have big national projects. I don't think those are, uh, those are off the table. I think the most successful big national projects and th those that we saw in the second half of FDR's administration are exactly the kind that I hope Biden looks at. <laughs> Um, Biden-Harris looks at, which were programs that, like the proposed Green New Deal, are national in scope, but decentralized in the way that it's played out. Like rural electrification uh, wasn't the government coming in and putting in uh, electrical poles, it's supporting local um, uh, uh, co-ops. Co-ops, yeah. Yeah. Co-ops so, are big in your book, a, yes. a return to co-ops, yeah. But, but there's the, the Teddy Roosevelt part, which I'm just much more worried about than, than perhaps you are, which is a, a vision, uh, Teddy Roosevelt, uh, uh, as, as you know, although uh, 
uh, many people do not, uh, really uh, was, it was not the great trust buster. FDR was a much right. more impressive trust buster. Um, later and, on in his term, as you point out. And, uh, yes. Sort of not so much early, but then later with Thurman Arnold and, 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 and again, I hope, I hope Biden doesn't have to relearn these lessons that top-down programs, if you want to revive a, a, an economy, you actually need decentralization. But, but Roosevelt really wanted to work more with, you don't need to be a Roosevelt expert to have this conversation. It's what you think about alliances between big business and government. And I'm much more concerned about business, especially business as it's currently constituted, by the way, with, this, with its current cultures and habits that alliances between the biggest businesses in our, our, our country, like Google and the uh, administration, are actually really dangerous and that can come to eat um, the democratic uh, mandate, that, that the uh, private sector will not be governed by it. So I, I tend to think that um, there's lots of different kinds of sector-specific solutions, um, but that the biggest threat is allowing concentrated private power, even if it's highly regulated. And, and I look to the 2008 crash and our response to the 2008 crash. And there were some great regulations. I worked hard on, on Dodd-Frank along with many other activists, but we didn't break up big banks. Uh, we, chose, we chose regulation solely. And those big banks took the political power that they still had and have ground a way to remove those regulations. So I think in terms of power, both in terms of labor unions, building up labor power and reducing concentrated private sector power. Uh, I don't think they're incompatible, but I'm less um, sunny than perhaps you are on the, uh, the long-term possibility of, of um, alliances between um, big business and government. <laughs> Well, I'm, I wouldn't. I wouldn't exactly characterize my position that okay. way. Okay. So, so uh, why, why, and, why uh, were the, but I, the uh, you know what I what I saw Teddy Roosevelt trying to do was in embryo what Franklin Roosevelt ultimately did. Okay. Uh, which is, um, but anyway, that's we we will uh, if we get to that debate, we will have won. I think. <laughs> I um, right exactly. Yeah, that's, uh, uh, by the way, you do have a line in here that I, um, um, you, you, um, you, you have a line that said business school students learn to invest in the areas where antitrust fails. I just want to shout out that wonderful um, section, but I'm looking for another quote that I wanted to uh, share uh, because I think it's so important. Um, I, I had it in my notes, but it's basically we should make it harder for capital to organize and easier for people uh, to organize, uh, which I think is a great concept. Um, let me go to the two questions for uh, two of the questions here and they really go to what we're talking about and thank you um, for these. Um, I'll just read them. Um, in the ultimate analysis, what power do we, the people, really have with real teeth, cap R-E-A-L, uh, to force, all caps, the issue of breaking up these companies, especially given the giant lobbies they have built in DC. It seems to me that the case per se for breaking them up is the lesser of the two problems, even if some of our leaders might uh, make it seem unobvious. And the second question is not unlike the first. Um, instead of pleading with the Zuckerbergs of the world to do the right thing, how can we get our regulators to be more proactive, vigilant, and engaged to do the jobs they were hired to do. I'm going to give a very short answer, and I want you to give a Good. longer answer. Um, my short answer is on the first question, how can we force the issue of breaking up these monopolies? Actually, one of the reasons I think Zephyr's book is so important is I think we are on the cusp of a new antitrust era. And I think you saw in the Democratic primaries, but also you've seen around the country people joining this issue in a way it had been totally ignored as as ever argued and now i think the question of monopoly uh, and the fact that our laws may not be very our monopoly laws themselves may not be very well configured uh to the problems that we face are on a lot of people's minds uh, just to give an example there was a hearing before the house uh, where David uh, Cicilline, the congressman from Rhode Island, uh, lifted up the habit of many tech companies to copy, kill, and acquire, um, which is something Zephyr writes about. Uh, 
uh, in the book. So I think this is happening, and political power has forced this issue to the fore in the past, which is why we were talking about history. But I'd like Zepper to take it, and instead of pleading with the Zuckerbergs of the world, how do we get our regulators to be more proactive, what do they do? How do they deal with that? Um, because I am struggling with the problem of what you do about um, uh, what you do about information technology. I, you know, I read your book on a Google app. Uh, you know, I, I mean, there's so much. Uh, we we don't want censorship, but we don't want them to be able to be censors either. How do we go forward on this stuff? Only for really small questions, right, EJ? <laughs> so, yeah, right. <laughs> right. So I just am so glad you you framed it that way because we are we we really are on the 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 cusp or in the in the early middle no middle early of a new anti monopoly movement and there's all of these different signs the hearing was a barn burner <laughs> the yeah. uh, house and they they came with receipts and really questioned this was it was a transformation from two years ago where it seemed like senators wanted to take selfies with Zuckerberg now they were bearing down asking hard questions getting uh, Bezos to admit things that we didn't know I mean it was a real hearing it was like ah oh, I want Congress to do more of this um, you see a, a real fight around um, uh, AB5 and the other uh, Uber fights in California um, it's a fight, but it's an engaged fight, and that's an anti-monopoly fight. It's a fight about um, economic power and how economic power is organized. You see New Jersey passing anti-monopoly laws on a statewide level. It's happening. Uh, New York just held a hearing on passing its own stronger version of the Sherman Act. So there's all these incredible seeds of movement. Um, and in the 19th century, there were anti-monopoly leagues all over the country. And I dream of, of thinking of this as like a, the beginning of a movement where instead of just, not just, really critical environmental groups, you will also be part of an anti-monopoly group um, that is pushing these issues. So it's on, the, it's on the cusp, but it's happening. It's a great time to join. Um, the pressure points are uh, agencies, the FTC, uh, and Congress, and your state houses. And they all interact with each other. You know that the state AGs, that hearing we were just talking about, they were on the edge of their seats watching to see what was happening in Washington so they could get information to bring their cases against Amazon and Google and their active investigations in most states against the big tech companies. And that then leads to lawmakers passing new laws. So there's a dynamic interaction happening. And, and one thing that I think is really important is one of the successes of um, the terrible successes of the economists behind who were pushing the Reagan vision of antitrust, which is as long as you have cheap toothpaste, there's no problem, um, uh, is that they, they, they just started scaring people. They got intimidated. They thought, well, I'm not an economist, so why should I, I I'm not allowed to have a voice on this. Now, I, if you're listening, you probably have a view on taxation and you're not an economist. You probably have a view on labor law and you're not an economist. But when it comes to antitrust, there's a kind of fear like, well, what if I don't know the market share? What if I hear a word that I don't understand? And, and of course, you know, understanding the details is important, but your job as a citizen is to uh, is to call your senator and say, hey, there's a problem. You figure out how to solve it. <laughs> and I think there's a problem of concentrated power and you figure out how to solve it. And an effective anti-monopoly movement will have people working on the details. There's a lot of solutions out there, but it will be, uh, will engage citizens because you don't need to be an expert to know that there's a concentration problem. And I love the question about begging Zuckerberg. All right, EJ, did you have some thoughts on the- No, no, go ahead. I, I just said begging Zuckerberg. I want you to go there. Yeah. Um, it's- uh, uh, I think it has been a disaster on the left that we've gotten used to begging companies instead of going to lawmakers. Um, and, it's, and that isn't to say that you shouldn't ask companies to be better, but our, our habits as citizens have been go, if there's a company abuse, go to the company first and, and, and then maybe organize others and organize a, a, a boycott. Um, and for the most part, when you have monopolized industries, it's basically impossible to effectively boycott because people have nowhere to go. Right. Um, so, yeah. 
Go ahead. I wanted to shout out my our friend, I think, Jamel Bowie's column in the New yeah. York Times about Facebook, which is worth looking at two. A, a question that I struggle with on this very issue, which is, is it better to treat them as public utilities or to bust them up as monopolies? Because these are two possible things. And then let me channel for the sake of argument, it's not really my view, but you hear it a lot. If you think about the 17 years that have passed since I think I first talked to you. Yes. Look at the technological innovation that is allowing us to do the very thing we are doing right now. Um, the amount of change is staggering in those 17 years. Um, a lot of critics of your position would say, yeah, uh, these companies have a whole ton of problems with them, and I don't really trust all the power they have. But will what you want to do um, <clears throat> get in the way of innovation? I think I know what your answer is because I read your book, <laughs> but I think it's, it's one of those things that does make people nervous when they want to go after big tech, and they say, but I like this machine I'm watching this event on. I like this technology that is allowing us to do all sorts of things. What do you say back to them? Well, I love it. I'm, I'm, I, I love this technology. And uh, thank you for the both questions. Um, I would say, um, and I actually don't have this in the book because um, I don't talk about innovation as much. There's some other great writing on this. Tim Wu is somebody who's written a lot about, uh, about innovation and antitrust. I, well, you quote but, Tim Wu. I guess what I'm saying yeah. is that there is, what I'm thinking of in the book are people who argue that concentration itself can actually get in the way of innovation. But anyway, yes. go, go ahead. Yeah, it, it does. And um, actually, but for the Microsoft case, which was just prior to our meeting, uh, you wouldn't have the incredible innovation of the last uh, 15, 20 years. So that, um, and but for the uh, uh, government hounding IBM for years, you wouldn't have seen the flowering uh, of IBM spinning off and uh, uh, flowering of, of innovation in the tech sector. And so there's a long history of um, innovation following big antitrust cases. Um, I believe that when you have uh, small businesses all subservient to Amazon, knowing that they can get copied, you're gonna get a lot less innovation than when you have a flower. But I actually think this question relates to your, your first question about regulate as utility or break it up. Because I actually think the answer is of course both, <laughs> but I wanted to give it a very spe specific example of both. A lot of times when we're talking about breaking up, we're not talking about, especially when we're talking about big tech, we're not talking about breaking up horizontally, but breaking up vertically. So, Amazon, you can be a place where sellers and buyers meet. Great. And then in that form, we should bring public utility regulation to bear to make sure there's open access, fair pricing. But you can't also own the warehouses and the shipping. There's no reason the warehouses and the shipping have to go with this platform. And we naturalize Amazon as like, as if of course they go together. But if you talk to sellers, they don't think so. I was talking to a seller two days ago who said, oh, they're trying to make me use fulfillment by Amazon, which is warehousing and shipping, but I don't want it. But, but basically Amazon makes it that you get better treatment and more likely to be found if you use their other ancillary services. And then Amazon has its own private brand that competes against those sellers. So the core of breaking up when we're talking about big tech is breaking up the thing where there's a huge value for us all being together. I like all being together in uh, 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 whether you have one or three, it's only gonna be a few big social media or big um, search or big uh, sellers, but they shouldn't also be competing on their own platforms. And that's the key, the core thing that um, Warren was talking about last year when in, in her real breakup, uh, breakout, breakup big tech. So break up by function, and then there's certain parts that should be regulated as a public utility. Um, but I got to tell you, when you want to beg Facebook, think how much easier it would be to beg Facebook if you could go to Instagram. <laughs> if you had, if, if there was, uh, you know, boycott can't work in a monopolized society when Facebook owns Instagram. And, and we're seeing that well, right you now. Have, you have no choice. Um, yeah. the, I, um, there's a bunch of questions here that I just want to, 
there are so many thoughtful people out there. I want to share some of your thoughts and we can both sort of yeah. pick it up as we go forward. Um, in this country, we have done a stellar job, perhaps too good a job, and now we are hoisted on our own batard, maybe, of defining or redefining capitalism, socialism, markets in convenient, bastardized ways, including how it is taught in business schools. Uh, no surprise, therefore, that we are confronted with false debate, solutions, insights, um, somebody is kind to applaud our energetic ideas about all of this. Um, but, uh, however, I do wonder in light of climate change denial, for instance, by the energy secretary, not to say anything of the POTUS on a host of issues, if you feel like you live in a parallel universe. Actually, I just want to answer that. No, <clears throat> I actually think both of us live in the majority universe. I think both of us live by every measure that I've seen in the universe, a majority of people, uh, live in, um, and I think it's the president and those guys who are in the parallel universe, but I will thank you for that. Um, I, I, I argument about the U.S. system, uh, political system being a duopoly, uh, shouldn't we have more competition there? Um, and um, I apparently asked some uh, somebody's question on their behalf. Uh, it's just a very sweet thank you. I appreciate that uh, to, or to both of us. Um, and how can we ensure that even if Trump wins, God forbid, the momentum of anti-monopoly that is built up continues and ultimately delivers on the potential? Uh, let me just jump in on a couple of quick, quick things there. One is on the duopoly, we could, that's for another night. We can have a long debate. I actually think the merit of a two-party system is that you know the coalition you're voting for on election day. The problem with multi-party systems is that the coalitions are formed after the election uh, and you often have no control over that. The most good example is when the Liberal Democrats uh, went into alliance with the Conservatives in Britain, even though two thirds of the Liberal Democratic voters would have preferred an alliance with Labour. That's a good example of that. At least in our system, we know going in. I am, however, for instant runoffs, uh, which would allow people, you, know, you rank candidates one, two, three, which would create some opening in the system, but you wouldn't wait. If you wanted to vote Green, but preferred a Democrat to a Republican, or you wanted to vote Libertarian, but preferred the Republican to the Democrat, you could win the Green or win the Libertarian, and then your second choice would win. So that's my way of dealing, but I, I actually, uh, that's a long uh, conversation. Um, the other, um, I'll leave it there. I'll, I'll let, uh, Zephyr's got the newer book, so she deserves the time tonight. Go ahead. Oh, wow. Well, there's so many different, uh, different issues here. One, pick one <laughs> yes. that you want. Yeah. I mean, the, the, I'll take a version of the alternate universe one, which is that I believe, and, um, I think EJ and I disagree on some things, but agree on some others that, that, um, uh, building a positive vision of a moral economy where people have dignity, a, 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 an economy that um, you actually feel like in your job, you could leave it, whether or not you choose to leave it, you could leave it, that you have a, you are not subservient, um, that, that laying out that vision and fighting like hell for that vision is actually what will allow Democrats to have power. And the point is not for Democrats to have power. The point is for people to have dignity. Um, but that, um, that laying that out is, is absolutely essential. And I would argue that a failure to recognize the role of big corporations in the growing inequality, but also despair and a sense of hopelessness and helplessness and paranoia has been a major failure on the Democratic Party's part. Um, and I and think helped elect Donald Trump. We can we can debate for all day long about what were the primary forces that elected Donald Trump, but it's very clear that he did very well in parts of the country that had been hammered by economic change, flight of jobs overseas, technological change that busted up jobs and break up of unions, all those kinds of things. A lot of those kinds of places, including my hometown of Fall River, Massachusetts, where Hillary won. But Trump cut the Democratic margin just because people were fed up with their economic circumstance. Obviously, race, we know, played a role in that victory. Sexism played a role in his victory. But these discontents were part of it, too. Well, I did want to talk about race. It's not something that's come up in the questions, but something that's really yes. important to me 
And um, I and think it's important in the book, I should say yeah. to your our yeah. listeners here. <laughs> and and and, imp and important in, in, in your book. And um, one of the things I think happens is that we tend to think about antitrust, if we think about it at all, and hopefully you'll think about it constantly now. Like once you see, see things through a power lens, that's all I'm really asking is like, look at the power dynamics, not just what the policy is, but who you're giving power to, um, is that to, to look at that um, through a race uh, neutral lens, and it is not race neutral. One of the devastating impacts of the merger wave that we have been in for 40 years is the total collapse of small businesses. And uh, people of color are far more likely to own a small business than run a Fortune 500 company. And so the effects have been the destruction of just looking at black business owners for a second, um, the uh, destruction of the uh, black insurance companies, destruction of black newspaper owners, destruction of, um, of uh, uh, black funeral homes. The funeral home industry is totally monopolized right now. And these are key centers of economic power, but also, as we know, key, key centers of political power. So when you look at the civil rights movement, you see the central role of independent black business owners in supporting unbelievably difficult, very dangerous uh, political choices. So the destruction of uh, the, the merger, merging is also merging towards um, not just concentrated power, but concentrated white power. Um, and it has been part of the, the uh, devastation of um, access to capital, as well as community and power in, um, in uh, uh, black communities around the country. And I think one of the reasons, um, I think there's a lot more that can be written about it, um, but it's, it's uh, central in, in, throughout my book, not just in this, in this chapter, but that there's, there is, you know, Wilson, uh, who you mentioned earlier, was one of the country's leading anti-monopolists and a horrible segregationist. And so although there's a 19th century history of anti-monopolists also being um, some of the strongest advocates um, for uh, uh, racial equality um, uh, and uh, um, for uh, against the sort of the, the credit monopolies and the horrible monopolization that uh, destroyed the uh, legal political powers of, um, of Black Americans in the late 19th century. In the 20th century, um, there's been less uh, engagement on monopoly and race. And I think it's a really important area to, to talk about. Um, and we're looking right now at a real um, a really horrific landscape where with the pandemic, may, as many as 40% of black businesses may go under. Um, and that is in, in part because of the pandemic, but it's also in part because we've created an, a, an economy where there's merger after merger leads to a handful of white owned businesses who, by the way, end up giving to Republicans and Democrats equally and supporting uh, 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 nonprofits that push voter suppression. So there's all kinds of race, <laughs> race uh, uh, economic power dimensions that I think are really important um, uh, to engage in. I don't know. EJ, um, if you had uh, any reactions to that section of the book or thoughts about race and, and monopoly. Right, no, I was, um, I, I am struck that there have been times in our history when certain forms of, uh, broadly speaking, populist or progressive uh, uh, action and politicians ended up being allied for particular historical moments with segregation. Uh, but I thought that your analysis of where power lies, it's, it's, it's I, I'll tell you what I thought about when I read that, which is the fight over the Supreme Court again, uh, mm -hmm. because what we're seeing here is an effort by conservatives to dominate a body to which there is no real appeal when the electorate itself is changing in fundamental ways, and it will give a veto power to conservative forces over the democratic electorate for a long time to come. I hate to bring it back to that, but it's very much no. on my mind. And I think that's 
what it's about. By the way, I, I would be remiss if I didn't read the questioner. Thank you for everybody for all these questions yeah. and, oh, and for the thoughtful and kind comments. But just got to read this one. It says, run, Zephyr, please run. Come to Washington State where your dad was from. Uh, so I just wanted to pass that on and you can, uh, um, you can uh, get in touch with that guy. Um, <laughs> We are almost out of time. There is one, there's so much in, the, in, in this book that you're going to want to read. Uh, I just want to thank you for the book and for really pushing this issue to the fore. The one I wanted, I, I, I would feel remiss if I didn't ask you about the impact of uh, Google and the like on journalism. Yeah. Um, and I'm not really thinking of the Washington Post, uh, which is sort of managing in this era, I'm thinking especially of all the great local papers in the country that are getting really hammered and are central to local democracy um, and that their collapse, my, my colleague and friend Margaret Sullivan wrote a, a little, great little book about this. Just talk about that briefly and then we'll, uh, we'll close with a thank you to everybody. Uh, but well, 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 thank you. And you and I both know that not Citizens United interacted with the collapse of, of local journalism in a just a horrific way. Um, that you both had the growth of corporate power and then the reduction of the sort of the key sinews of information of local journalism at exactly the same time. And all I will say, just as a teaser, is that, again, I think people think it is inevitable that if you have technology or if you have an internet then local journalism can't survive and that's just not true we have as uh, ej pointed out we have choices here it's not that it's easy but we can actually understand that google and facebook are uh, basically taking the same ad dollars that local papers used to rely on um, and making money off of the great journalism that is being done locally and we don't have to allow it that's that that's the bottom line <laughs> um, message there is don't naturalize it. And you know, Amy Klobuchar has been an incredible leader on this. Uh, mm -hmm. Three years ago, Klobuchar did a, did a great event with an organization I'm part of in uh, DC on local journalism, on Facebook and Google. And I actually think her, her combined understanding of, of the news industry and ag has made her an incredible leader on this issue. So again, there's interesting alliances where you see Sanders and Klobuchar and Warren coming from very different places, but all making anti-monopoly like really central to, to who they are. Well, in fact, the, the notion of moral capitalism that you write about um, uh, in the book, um, you know, and moral markets, the fact that we can have moral markets, um, there are a lot of smaller newspaper proprietors who are trying to figure out how to organize almost cooperatively, like you're cooperatives to try to preserve uh, local journalism. Um, yeah. So I just want to remind everybody there's an election six weeks away. There's a lot to be done. Uh, some of the questions uh, reflected a bit of impatience with the political system, which I think both of us share at many times. On the other hand, there is no alternative but to act. Um, a, a philosopher once said that he advised uh, pessimism of the intellect and optimism of the will, uh, which I always like very much. And I just want to thank Powell's, a great bookstore, and thank Zephyr uh, for the, having, having a chance just to have this conversation of writing a great book. Well, I want to thank Powell's for, for hosting this. It's uh, my, I, my uh, late grandmother uh, lived in uh, nearby. And once a year, I would go visit her. She, she passed two years ago. But it's been two years since I've been. And it is one of the best places in the world. And uh, thank you for existing. And EJ, I wish I had the uh, capaciousness of your intellect <laughs> and, and empathy. It is amazing and really a privilege to get to have this conversation with you. Oh, bless you. I feel the same way. It's a great, great joy. Thank you. And, and thank you in the rare book room there for bringing us <laughs> yes. together. I appreciate it so much. <laughs> yes, it's very quiet here at the store, particularly in the rare book room. I hope that in the future we're able to host both of you at the store again. 
I would love that. Thank you. <laughs> uh, thank you to everyone for joining us for tonight's event. It was a pleasure. Fascinating conversation, particularly in these political times. Uh, you can support both EJ and Zephyr by purchasing a copy of their books at Powell's.com. Zephyr's new book is Break Em Up, Recovering Our Freedom from Big Egg, Big Tech, and Big Money. And EJ's new book is Code Red. Both are listed at Powell's.com. While you're at Powell's.com, you can check out our other upcoming virtual events, and we look forward to seeing all of you back again on one of these events and hopefully into our stores soon. Thank you very much. Have a good night. Good night. Good night. Thank you. Thank you.